Okay, thank you very much. Um, thank you, Ratio, so much for having me here. This is my first time in um, Sofia, so it's absolutely really lovely to be here, and I'm really pleased to talk about dinosaurs, and in particular, dinosaur social behavior. This is something I've been working on for about 10 years now, uh, and it's a fairly big and contentious subject in paleontology, so it's really quite nice to bring it to another audience. Um, but I have to start with this. Every time you say you're a paleontologist, you have to prove it by proving that you dig dinosaurs up in the field, and you go to weird and exotic places and sit in the desert and look at stuff. And I do, but to be honest, I really don't do it very much. Um, Field work, I've probably spent like about two months in the field total in 20 years of this job. Uh, so I'm really not one of those guys who sits and dig holes, though it can be quite fun. Um, but I poke around at a lot of things. I'm quite well known for working on tyrannosaurs, like this guy from China. And I'm quite well known for working on pterosaurs, like this lovely little guy from Germany that I worked on. And they cover a whole range of different things. Uh, but really, it's dinosaurs that I do most of, and it's dinosaurs that I'm here to talk about. And we've got to kind of start with a couple of basics, because I think people often have a bit of a misunderstanding about what dinosaurs actually are and just how diverse they were. So we now know of about 1,500 species of dinosaurs. I think most people can name T-Rex, Stegosaurus, Diplodocus, Velociraptor, and then they start to run out, or they end up on Jurassic Park names like Indominus. Um, no, there's loads and loads and loads and loads of dinosaurs. They were around for about 175 million years. They lived on every continent. Uh, they're not just in jungles and hot tropical environments, but we got them in deserts, we got them in mountains, they were down by the sea. Um, they were really going everywhere and doing everything on land for pretty much that entire period. And we can break dinosaurs up into three big groups, so I just want to run over them very briefly. These are the first guys, these are the theropods. Um, this includes pretty much all the carnivores. Some of these guys had actually switched and went on to become herbivores, uh, but they all walk around on their back legs. Most of them have got big, sharp teeth. Most of them are predators. Then we've got the sauropodomorphs, so a complicated name, but these are the big guys. Uh, pretty much all of these are over a ton. The big ones, like we said in the discussion, some of these animals are 50, 60, 70 tons in mass. This is an entire herd of elephants bolted together into a single animal walking around occupying the landscape. Uh, and some of those were probably in large herds as well. So this is just a phenomenal amount of biomass just occupying space. Um, and yeah, mostly big, mostly long necks, mostly long tails. And then we have a group called the Ornithischians, and that's basically everything else. If it's not a two-legged predator or a big fat thing with a long neck, it's an Ornithischian. And really, the easiest way of defining them is the other dinosaurs. But they're also the guys with all the weird head crests and all the weird spikes and plates and armors and spines and fins and all kinds of other weird things going on, which is a fairly big part of what I want to talk about today, because what I'm really focusing on today is social dinosaurs. Um, but if we're going to talk about dinosaur behavior, we've got to kind of talk about animal behavior. And so we have to start with the fact that animals do weird things all the time. And here's a crocodile up a tree. Um, this is not where we normally think of crocodiles as spending much of their lives. This isn't normal for them. But actually, if you hunt around online, you can find quite a few photos of crocodiles up trees. They do it more often than you might think. Um, and here's an elephant. I know it's not a wonderful photo, but that's an Asian elephant. This is 15 kilometers off the nearest coastline. We don't usually think of elephants as swimming out to sea, uh, and certainly not beyond kind of maybe paddling along the beach. But no, they're quite happy to swim between islands, and this is a pretty significant difference for distance for an animal like that to cover. So again, animals do weird things. Animals do things that you wouldn't necessarily predict from their anatomy. And if it's rare, that doesn't mean they don't do it. But it also means for me as a paleontologist, I have to run with the problem that all the data I have is from the fossil record. That's one moment in time that captured an animal. So if we keep finding elephants out to sea, we'd easily conclude that elephants live in the sea and swim around a lot. Whereas, no, we just happen to have found the one animal that decided to go for a swim in the sea and drowned, and that's why we have it. So yeah. Trying to reconstruct dinosaur behavior is 
basically a nightmare. Most skeletons are very, very incomplete. I said there's 1,500 dinosaur species. Maybe only 200 of them are known from more than one skeleton. And perhaps 1,000 of those, the skeleton is incomplete. It's actually only just a few bones. We don't regularly dig up huge numbers of good skeletons. We're looking at bits. Uh, and those bits represent single moments in time, and they're an incomplete record. So how are we going to reconstruct behavior? Well, one of the ways we can do that is to try and look for multiple lines of evidence, ideally those that are more or less independent from each other, that all kind of say the same thing, and then that's probably a good indication that that's a normal part of the lifestyle of that animal. So this guy up here, this is Baryonyx. This is a British carnivore. This is a theropod. It's a fairly close relative of Spinosaurus, which I'm sure many of you have heard of, was in one of the Jurassic parks, has been in the news quite a lot in the last five or six years because of some new specimens we found. It's seven, eight meters long. It's a decent-sized carnivore. And multiple people suggested that Baryonyx and some of the other Spinosaurs ate a fair bit of fish because they've got kind of crocodile-like heads. That's not an unreasonable uh, idea, but how can we test that? Well, we can do it in a bunch of ways, and so this diagram shows that a bit. So number one, we've got a 3D scan of the nose of Baryonyx, and basically put it through a computer program that tests how it responds to different kind of stresses and different kind of pressures. And what we found is that actually it responds just like other crocodiles and actually quite differently to other dinosaurs. So that kind of suggests it's doing something crocodile-like. Uh, number two, it's not the greatest drawing. I did that one for a paper. It's a bit terrible, but it's fine for what it needs to be. Uh, their tooth shape, their tooth shape is actually similar to crocodiles, and it's similar to some dolphins, and it's similar to some of the big marine reptiles that lived at the same time, which we know lived in the sea and ate fish. In other words, their teeth are shaped like fish-eating animals. And again, they're not actually shaped like those of most other theropod dinosaurs. Uh, number three, this is a dead giveaway. Uh, it may not look like very much, but that's actually a big scale from a big fish. And that scale was found in the chest cavity of the one good specimen of baryonyx we have. And more than that, it's got weird etching on the surface of the scale from acid. Presumably stomach acid, because baryonyx literally ate at least one fish. And then finally, that last little graph at the bottom, it doesn't look like very much. This is just diagrammatic. Um, but basically, there's some isotopic signatures that you can get even from the fossil record that are retained in the bones, and particularly enamel of fossil animals, that can give you an indication of whether or not they mostly ate and lived in water or on land. And Baryonyx's isotopic signatures match things like hippos, crocodiles, herons, uh, terrapins, and turtles, and they don't match other theropod dinosaurs. So we've actually got four or five different separate ideas which we can use to link baryonyx towards eating fish in difference to other theropods. And so we can start to build up a real picture and understanding of what it might be doing, and this is the sort of way I think we can try and build up pictures of behavior. But the title is Jurassic Social Club because we're talking about uh, sociality and living in groups. And we do absolutely find dinosaurs in groups. Uh, this is a little thing called Coelophysis uh, from New Mexico. Uh, Coelophysis is found in a group of about 200 animals together. So like I said, we do rarely find big clusters of dinosaurs in one place, but we do have it, and here is a great example. Uh, and here's another one. These are some ornithomimosaurs from Mongolia. Uh, there's actually three skeletons there. Uh, the one on the far left is just a couple of bones, but there is a third animal. But you can see here there's two beautiful skeletons side by side. But again, these are buried. These were the animals as we found them. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that they were um, living together most of their lives. We have some, some more evidence down here. So on the left, we've got a, a huge bone bed that I worked on in China. Uh, there's bones of about 100, 150 different animals there. But as you can see, they're all scattered across the landscape. Something tore these skeletons apart, probably a flash flood, and pulled them into pieces. And here we see a trackway. So there's two pairs of tracks of sauropod dinosaurs uh, walking along through ancient mud, which have been preserved. And you'd look at data like this, and you'd look at like those last couple of slides that I showed, and you'd think, well, OK, you've got a whole bunch of dinosaurs that died together, or in the case of the tracks that were walking together. So they lived together, right? Because if they were together when they died, they must have been living together. Um, and 
Well, maybe. So here's a kind of traditional group of what we think of as really social animals, meerkats. They live in groups, um, they interact with each other, they share duties of looking out for predators and helping to raise the offspring and everything else. And we can imagine if a flash flood came in and wiped these cute little critters away and buried them, that I, as a paleontologist, or my colleagues would dig them up and go, oh, great, here's a little group living together. Um, but then you get things like this as well. Yeah, bears, famously those animals that live in groups and they work together and they take turns looking out for predators and they rear the offspring. If a flash flood came in and buried them, we'd have a group of bears together. So bears live in groups, right? No, it's entirely context dependent. It depends what they're doing at the time and how they're living. The paleontological record is really good at lying to us, or at least it has the potential to lie to us. And so in order to look at dinosaur behavior, we really kind of need to understand animal behavior. So here's another big group. These are um, uh, African water buffalo or Cape water buffalo. Um, this is a photo I took in South Africa. This herd is about five times this size. There was like a thousand animals there. And you will regularly see herds of water buffalo of this kind of size, you know, hundreds and hundreds of individuals. But actually, if you study their social behavior, what you actually find out is that herd is made up of dozens of herds of about five to ten animals. Some of them are a bull with a group of calves, uh, sorry, bull with a group of um, cows. Some of them are cows and calves, and some of them are all young males together. So they're actually a whole bunch of little subgroups all traveling together in one big group. But again, would you tell that from footprints or from some giant mass burial of the kind that we often find in the fossil record? And here's another one. So wildebeest, we've all seen images like this before, the famous Masai Mara Serengeti crossing that they do twice a year as they travel around uh, East Africa and Kenya and Tanzania, moving with the rains to try and find the best food. Wildebeest have a very similar system to water buffalo. They're actually composed of small herds within that giant herd. But this is what happens in East Africa. If you travel down to South Africa at the same time, this is what you see. One male standing on his own. The females will move around in a small group of about half a dozen looking for food, often with their calves. The males will stay in place and not move the entire year. And during the dry season, they just run low on food, but they defend their territory waiting for the females to come back. So the same species, just a couple of thousand kilometers apart in the same part of the world, are doing completely different things at the same time of year, depending on the local environment. So we always have to think about the ecological context, what is going on, what might be driving these animals coming together, how might they be operating, what systems are changing them, and just be aware of the plasticity. What we see in one animal or one group of animals from a fossil is not necessarily what all the others are doing of that species, let alone any other species. So, moving on, I want to talk about ceratopsians. So this is one of the ornithischian dinosaurs. Remember, those all the herbivores, all the weird ones. And ceratopsians, you probably know. This guy on the left is Triceratops, the one famous one, one of the few dinosaurs everyone can name. But ceratopsians are really, really varied. There's loads and loads of different species, 100 or so or more. And what really makes them stand out is all the different ornaments on their heads. So famously, Triceratops has these three horns on his face and then the big frill out back. Uh, but we have this guy on the right, Pachyrhinosaurus, who just has a giant boss on the nose and then some little spikes at the back of his head. We have things like this, Styracosaurus, with a huge nose horn and spikes out the back. And then Inainosaurus and Diabloceratops, completely different combinations of frills and spikes and horns. There's an almost endless array. In fact, one of the main ways that we can tell different species of ceratopsians apart is all the different horns and spikes and frills that they have. They're really, really varied. And then there's this little guy. This is Protoceratops from uh, Mongolia. Um, I love Protoceratops. It's probably my favorite dinosaur. I've probably done more work on this animal than any others. They're really cute. It's Triceratops without the horns. Um, they're about two meters long for a really big one. Uh, they lived about 75 million years ago, give or take, so pretty close to the very end of the dinosaurs. Um, and you find them across Mongolia and down into uh, what is now modern northern China. 
Um, and one of the reasons I love them is we have loads and loads and loads of skulls and skeletons of protoceratops. As a paleontologist, one of our biggest problems we have is data. Um, you know, my fellow biologists and uh, uh, zoologists and ecologists, they go, well, we've done this study and we've measured 150 animals, but I'm not sure we've got quite enough data, so we're going to go and measure another 100. And I'm like, I've got half a leg. Um, that's it. That's all the data I have. Um, again, having more than five is a lot. A lot. And we have loads of protoceratops. Um, we have loads of protoceratops. We have loads of protoceratops. Um, this isn't half of them, quite literally. Uh, we've probably got 100 decent skeletons, and most of those are entirely complete and articulated. So every bone, or nearly every bone, and as you can see, often in really, really good condition, um, and actually from very small animals and eggs all the way up to adults. What's also really nice is they pretty much all come from one time and one place. As near as you can ever really get for fossils as a whole, this is one population. Um, so we can kind of treat them as a single group of animals. And that means they're a fantastic model for when you want to look at what are dinosaurs doing and how are they behaving and how are they acting. Um, I should say, part of the reason we have so many of them uh, is because uh, Protoceratops lived in what was more or less a desert. So this is northern China and uh, southern Mongolia as it is now. Uh, that very handsome man wearing white and just lying in a hole in the ground is me 15 years ago in China, uh, trying to dig up some uh, ankylosaurs. Um, and this is what it looks like now. It's also what it looked like about 70, 80 million years ago. Pretty much the same. And deserts are actually amazing places for forming fossils. Uh, because when you die uh, out in the desert, there's very little decay. There's very few predators and scavengers around, and it's so so dry, there's very little bacteria or anything to break your bones down. So bones tend to sit out on the surface. This is an old dead goat. Uh, in fact, there's a famous dig site uh, that the American Museum of Natural History found out in Mongolia in something like the mid-90s. Um, and they used to go back to it every year and keep excavating more and more dinosaurs and more and more dinosaur fossils and eggs. And the reason they were able to go back to the same place every year is because there was a dead camel there. And every year they drive back and camp next to the dead camel because it just stayed there for 20 years. But that's really significant because that means it's got 20 years to try and get buried. It's got 20 years for a sandstorm or a sand dune to cover it and the chance to turn into a fossil. Whereas if that was 20 years here or 20 years in North America, a wolf or a bear would have eaten it, a flood would have washed it away, just the bacteria would get to it and it would fall apart. So deserts are brilliant for preserving fossils. And it means that, yeah, you just find Predoceratops everywhere. I've spent less than three weeks digging in these kind of environments. And here's some of the Predoceratops stuff I've found or from the teams I've been with have dug up. There's some teeth, there's a tail, there's a small skull. And that horrible fragment in the bottom corner looks very uninteresting uh, until I tell you that those little lines that are dragged across the surface, they're the bite marks of a velociraptor. Um, which normally you say, how do you know that? But the answer is because we found the velociraptor teeth next to them where it broke its teeth off doing that, which is quite a good indication um, that that was going on. So you can restore behavior from some very odd bits of uh, detail uh, with the right fossils. So what does this mean about groups? Well, this is a group of hatchling protoceratops. So this is 15 animals all found together. Um, the biggest skull is about this big, so four or five centimeters. These are very, very small animals, so a few weeks or maybe a few months old, more or less just out of the egg, in a group. Just them, no adults around. And then this specimen um, has been knocking around for a few years. Uh, these are two what we'd call sub-adult animals, they're not quite big enough to be adults, but they're still growing in human equivalents. They're 13, 14, 15. They're kind of teenagers. They're nearly mature, but they're not quite there. Um, there's only two of them, but they're clearly preserved together side by side. Uh, and again, no other animals around. There's also a very annoyingly unpublished, it's been documented in the scientific literature, but it's never been written up as a proper description, two different records of adult groups, herds, whatever you want to call them, of Predoceratops found together. Those were recorded back in the late 80s. Um, I hope those will be written up formally one day by the team that found them. 
Um, and then there's these guys. So I was lucky enough to see these. These are Mongolian in origin. I was lucky enough to see these uh, in Japan, where they were being studied at the time, and I was invited to contribute to this research. And hopefully you can see there are three skulls along the bottom and another skeleton on top. We've got four animals there. Um, at least. They're really unusual. All the other records, as you've seen, have the animals in kind of similar orientations, but in this case they're all aligned differently, but they're all pointing their heads up, and indeed one has its mouth open. And if you look at the nature of the sand within this block and how the sand has formed and fallen, it genuinely looks like a sand dune collapse. And this would explain why they're all trying to climb upwards and they've got their mouths open. These animals probably basically suffocated alive. Um, which was really unfortunate for them, but boy, this is one of the best fossils I've ever seen, and it's certainly the best one I've ever worked on. And it gives us this lovely picture of a group, again, of similarly sized animals living together at the time that they died. And so if we start putting these together, we can see a pattern. We have a group of 15 very young individuals together. We have a group of four young individuals together, but a bit older. They're about twice the size. We have a group of two sub-adults, about five times that size, and then two known groups of adults that are, again, a bit bigger than the sub-adults. And in every single case, they're only found with animals of the same size and the same age. And so this really suggests that protoceratops, at least, we have one dinosaur where we can pretty confidently say they are spending a real serious amount of time in groups throughout their lives, and those groups are dedicated. That is, they are separated by the size and age of those animals. We're not mixing groups together here. So if we assemble them together, you can see uh, not just that change in size, obviously I've blown them up here, uh, but also the change in frill, which we'll get back to in a minute. If we plot them by size, we see them like this, the hatchlings on the right, through to the babies I described recently, the sub-adults, and then the adults. So you can see there's a very, very big difference in size here between these animals, and yet they're still operating under the same kind of behavioral regime of staying in these groups of associated sizes. Which begs the question, why live in a group? Why are they doing this? Well, there's a couple of big reasons that animals will do that. One of which, of course, is to mate. So you can see at the bottom, here's a whole bunch of uh, male grouse displaying to uh, females. So they've all come together. We talked about sexual selection in the discussion. All the males are puffing themselves up and showing off their features, and the females are wandering around trying to find the best males. Uh, so that's a really important reason that a group of animals might form. But Maybe they hang around all year like that, but maybe it's temporary. Another big reason is for a limited resource. Here we've got hippos lying in water. Hippos really need water. When the dry season kicks in and the water runs out, that's going to really force animals together. Even if they'd prefer to be apart, you'll start seeing things like hippos and crocodiles ending up in a fairly narrow space and all coming together. So that's another big reason. But juveniles have, you know, juveniles in particular, they're not going to mate. They haven't reached sexual maturity yet. That's not a big deal. Um, and if it was something like limited water or limited food or a migration, we'd expect to see adults and juveniles being forced into the same situation. We're not seeing that with Predoceratops because they're all different, they're, they're these size separated groups. So why do it? Well, it's very notable that. Baby dinosaurs, in general, are rare in the fossil record. Maybe only about one in five skeletons is not a subadult or adult. And yet, when we do find baby dinosaurs, they're very often in groups. Nearly half the record of groups of dinosaurs are juveniles, when they only make up one-fifth of the fossils. So that really suggests that there's something going on for juvenile dinosaurs that isn't going on for adult dinosaurs. So here's a cluster of another different ceratopsian group. And here, I'm sorry, this photo isn't great, but there's five or six skeletons there of more ornithomimids, animals like Gallimimus. That's part of a much bigger section. Um, I think there are about 25 individuals in that one. Again all juveniles. So why are juveniles clustering when the adults don't necessarily need to? Um, this may not look like very much. Uh, this is a, an x-ray of a pair of tail bones, um, which is why it's all a bit fuzzy and black and white. But there's a very, very obvious white oval shape in the middle of those. That white oval shape is a T-Rex tooth. 
That is a T-Rex tooth where the T-Rex bit the tail of a dinosaur and broke a tooth off in it. And you'd think, well, surely that sticks out like a sore thumb. You can't miss that. Well, you can because the bone had grown back over it. That animal survived. The bone continued to grow. It healed up and covered the tooth. You can basically only see it in an x-ray. Um, this is a different one. This is a tibia, so a shin bone of another dinosaur. Um, those white arrows are pointing to another block of uh, a gouge on the left uh, with a little speck of bone, and then inside there's a little arrow of bone. You'll be unsurprised to learn that's another T-Rex tooth broken off in a bone where the bone has grown back over the top of it. And then we have this. This is a T-Rex coprolite. This is fossil feces. This is a big T-Rex poo. And what it's full of is broken bones. And if you pick those bits of bones out and you put them back together, you can actually restore the little dinosaur that was inside. And the key word is little. That T-Rex ate a baby dinosaur. The two with teeth broken off in them were both juvenile dinosaurs. In fact, every record we have of bitten, healed bones, broken teeth, and stomach contents, i.e. where something was eaten by a theropod, is of a juvenile. Theropods fundamentally ate juveniles. And in fact, this is what modern predators do today. The vast majority of predators, and I don't just mean mammals, I mean birds. This is true of things like praying mantis. This has been shown to be true of things like starfish. Prefer to tackle juvenile prey. So why are juveniles hanging around in groups? Because they don't want to get eaten. Um, being eaten is really bad. Um, so yeah. Um, and though this probably explains why we're missing lots of baby dinosaurs from the fossil record, but when we do find them, they're in groups. Because dinosaurs usually laid tons of eggs at a time. Dinosaurs were laying huge numbers of eggs. There should be vast numbers of infant and baby dinosaurs running around the landscape for most of the time of the dinosaurs, and yet almost none of them ever enter the fossil record. Now, admittedly, there are some other biases about that, which I'm going to conveniently overlook, but probably Probably the main reason is because they're being eaten. Again, we see this again and again and again. Juveniles are almost always the favored prey of predators where they're available. First of all, they're usually smaller than you. That makes them easier to overpower and easier to kill and easier to eat, and that's pretty a good start. Secondly, there's usually loads of them, particularly in a system like dinosaurs, where they're laying tons and tons of eggs at a time. You might come across 20 or 30 babies for every adult that you come across. Um, Go for them, they're easy pickings, particularly when they're usually naive. One of the single biggest problems that juvenile animals face is although there's all kinds of instinct built into them, most of them don't actually know what predators are. They have to learn individual predators, they have to learn escape responses, they have to work out how to avoid them. And in doing so, they often have some very messy encounters that kill some of them off, um, or at least leave them injured with things like T-Rex teeth broken off in them. Um, but also another big factor is often they lack the protections of adults, not just size, but again, you know, baby triceratops don't have horns. The baby ankylosaurs, the armored dinosaurs with the big tail clubs, they don't have armor when they're babies. And we see that in cows and sheep too. The babies don't have horns that the adults do. Baby elephants don't have tusks. They don't have the weapons that would help protect them. So this is why they want to hang around in groups. This is a massive defense system against predation. You get two big bonuses of being in a group. First is what we call the vigilance effect. Um, you're spending a long time eating as a herbivore. Predators can come and grab you. But if there's five or six or 10 of you, someone's probably looking out all the time. Because every time you're not eating, you're not eating. If you're spending time looking around, you're not getting any food. So if there's a whole bunch of you doing that and sharing that responsibility, you'll eat more food and keep an eye out for predators. And the other one is the dilution effect. If a predator does suddenly turn up and decide to have a go at your group, well, he might eat Steve rather than you. Uh, if you're the only one there, your dinner, if there's a whole bunch of you, you stand a chance of surviving. So this is a really, really common phenomenon. Again, throughout animal life, or at least, you know, 
things like tetrapods and big insects and beetles and things like this, any kind of big mobile animal, um, this tends to be a very, very common pattern. So we would expect juveniles to hang around in groups to avoid predators, but adults maybe not. And that actually matches what we see with dinosaurs. The other big aspect of social behavior that we might want to talk about is sex. We talk, again, we talked about sexual selection, um, and this comes in kind of two fairly big flavors. Differences in sexes, as produced by things like color patterns and behaviors, and things like this uh, peacock pheasant display, um, and horns and frills and colors, and all kinds of other things like that. Um, but the other aspect of this is sexual dimorphism, literally two shapes, um, when males and females fundamentally look different to each other. So as you see the giraffe here on the right, there's a much taller male um, who's more robust with a bigger head and bigger horns than the female that he's with at the time. So there's two kind of subtly different aspects that we might want to look at and know if that's going on in dinosaurs and what they're doing. And certainly loads and loads of dinosaurs have some kind of feature that could easily be a display feature. So things like the plates along the back of stegosaurs, and then things like these kind of little hornlets we have over the eyes of, this is an allosaurus, or this head crest uh, that we have in this, this is an oviraptor from Mongolia, um, or even some of the hadrosaurs, the duck-billed dinosaurs, these enormous crests on the top of their heads, uh, which are also resonating chambers, so they're probably making big noises with them, as well as being able to use them as some kind of visual display. Um, and again, as talked in the discussion, you know, can you try and demonstrate that these are actually some kind of sexually selected display feature, or social dominance signal, or something like that, beyond saying, well, it's big and weird and we can't think what else it might be? And the answer is yes. And the main way you can try and do this is looking at the growth rate. So I mentioned things like you know, sheep and cows, something we're all quite familiar with. Even a half size or even three quarter size animal barely has horns at all. They haven't started growing. And then in the last few months when they get into fully adult size, whoop, their horns grow really, really fast. And this is a super common pattern for things like this. When you're a baby of almost any, of almost any flavor, the single biggest thing that's going to stop you becoming an adult is being eaten. And the quickest way to get past that is grow. So you put as much effort as you can into growing as fast as possible and getting as big as possible. Because if you don't ever reach adult maturity, you're never going to leave any offspring anyway. But once you hit adult size, well, now suddenly sex is really important, and you've stopped growing. So you can put that energy into growing your big signal or your horns for fighting or something like that. And we see this here, for example, with this chameleon. So the uh, blue dots on the right is looking at the length of the tongue versus the size of the chameleon. And yeah, bigger chameleons have a slightly bigger tongue than smaller chameleons, but it basically sits on a line. Tongue size is about the same as chameleon size. But look at the horns on the left in red. When you get bigger, they grow really, really fast. And indeed, slightly larger chameleons at the upper end, those really fit individuals, the healthiest one who are best adapted and doing really well, have much bigger horns than you would predict. So these things grow really fast, and they're much, much bigger in big animals than you would predict by chance. And again, this is just one graph from a whole series that we did uh, on a paper. This is led by a colleague of mine, Devin O'Brien. Uh, we had something like 50 different animals in here and explored all kinds of different signals and structures, and this is a repeated pattern. Sexually selected features grow fast when animals hit sexual maturity. So can we do that for protoceratops? Because remember I said we have everything from babies to big adults. We can, and lo and behold, if you look at the growth rate of that frill, it does exactly that. It grows much, much faster. It both grows longer and wider when these animals hit mid-size. Before that, it trucks along barely growing at all. About the time they hit sub-adult size, where they're a teenager, where they're probably about to hit sexual maturity, suddenly the frill gets much longer and much wider. It fits the pattern perfectly. It doesn't just look like a signal. The growth trajectory suggests that it is a signal. Can we do better? Well, my PhD student, Andy Knapp, a few years ago, did this wonderful work. Um, he basically went and 3D surface scanned. I think we ended up with 63 different skulls for protoceratops. Again, I cannot stress 
just how weird that is, the idea that you could have a dinosaur data set of 60 animals in 3D from juveniles to adults, well preserved enough you could do this with. Um, but did that surface scan basically built these landmarks, so these uh, dedicated dots across the surface, and then basically let the computer decide what was going on with it. And what we see on the right-hand side at the bottom is a baby with basically no frill, and it's kind of a shelf sticking straight out the back of the head, to an adult where that frill is basically bigger than the skull and now sticking straight up off the top of its head and being really, really obvious and a massive shape. So you can completely see the frill shape change. But better than that, Andy could then ask it, well, are certain bits of the skull growing in different ways? And it said, well, yes, actually, there are. There are five different parts of the skull. Again, we didn't choose these. The computer algorithm has selected these as distinct regions of the skull that grow in different ways. And perhaps unsurprisingly, it's the frill in red that it identified as the biggest structure that changed the most in the shortest period of time. So a perfect demonstration of what we'd expect from a sexually selected structure and some kind of sexual signal for males to signal to other males, uh, but also to females, but potentially for females to signal to each other and males as well. Because this brings us on to the problem of sexual dimorphism. Can we tell males and females apart in the fossil record? And the answer for dinosaurs is sort of a bit under certain circumstances. Um, so you look at this, and here we have a oviraptor, so a predatory dinosaur, sitting on a nest of eggs. So you can see the ring of eggs underneath it. This actually is not far from the dead camel. Um, and you'd immediately think, oh, well, that's a mother sitting on her nest of eggs. Um, except, for example, in ostriches, it's males that sit on the eggs, not the females. So just because that animal's sitting on a nest doesn't mean that it's a female. For a couple of females, we can tell that they are females because of the nature of their bones. But this is a special feature that they have only during the egg-laying season. So actually, even an animal that's sitting on its eggs is not laying eggs. This could be a female and still not show that characteristic bone structure. So can we tell males from females? Are they actually different from each other? Is there dimorphism? Well, maybe, but probably the main reason we can't tell is the way in which dinosaurs grow. So if we look at um, a rhea here in red, so the bird on the left-hand side, um, birds and mammals grow really, really fast. Humans are actually a bit of an uh, unusual case in this regard. We don't grow quite that quickly. But mostly these things shoot up to adult size, usually in only a couple of years, and then they sit at that size for the entire rest of their lives. Um, even things like elephants would still reach adult size in 10, 12 years and then live till they're 50 or 60. So they're still spending most of their life at adult size. And what that means is, if we're randomly picking individuals from the population to enter the fossil record, they're pretty much all going to be adult. Um, they're pretty much all going to be their final size. They couldn't have grown any more. Whereas if we do that for things like dinosaurs, and there's one alligator in the middle there with the green line, they grow much, much, much more slowly. They're actually growing really quite fast. These are growing much faster than the average reptile or the average fish, for example, but they don't hit that super burst and go all the way up to adult size instantly. Which means if we're picking their populations almost at random from across their lifespan, very often they still had quite a bit of growing to do. Even if they're an adult, even if they're well towards the right-hand side of the graph, they've still got more growing to do. They're not at final size. What does that mean for sexual dimorphism? Well, it means that if I randomly pick things like rears, where males are bigger than females, and I get a whole bunch of them, they're all final size. So if I've got some big ones and I've got some slightly smaller ones, that's probably male and female. But if I do that for dinosaurs, they're just going to be a scatter of sizes. And I could have a big female or a small male, and they'd basically look the same to me. I wouldn't be able to tell them apart. Um, that's kind of a problem. And what's worse is that's true not just of things like 
general size, but actually even features on their skeleton. So this guy here, this is a gharial. This is this rare Indian uh, crocodilian, uh, India, Nepal, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and that region. Um, they have these beautiful long noses, and they have this enormous expansion at the end of the nose. And that's present only in males. Females don't have it at all. They have a much more normal crocodile-like snout. So we've got a feature present in males that's not in females. Now, annoyingly, that thing's actually mostly soft tissue. It's kind of cartilaginous, like our noses. But if you look at the bone underneath, so if you look at the picture on the left, that's a female on the left and a male on the right. You can see the male one expands massively, and it's got this big kind of flattened plate in the middle of the top. So actually, you can just look at their nose, and the male looks really different to the female. Um, so with a group of colleagues, we measured pretty much every gharial skull that was available in collections around the world. We got to about 100 specimens, and as part of that, we actually found a bunch of specimens in collections that museums didn't know they had, so that was a bonus. And then we measured them, and it's like, well, males and females are really easy to tell apart, right? And these skulls mostly came from museums, where museums carefully record the sex of the animal when it was entered into the collection. So we've got young males in there too. And what we found is, you pretty much can't tell them apart. Despite this feature, it grows so slowly and so late, and there are really big females in there with weird noses, that even with a data set of 100 skulls, where we knew the sex of the males and females, statistically, it was almost impossible to tell them apart. So when we find five dinosaur skeletons, and people go, oh, can you tell which is male or which is female? Or they go, well, why haven't we found sexual dimorphism with this amazing data set of five skeletons? This is the answer. We can't tell them apart with 100 when we know the correct answer. So of course we can't tell it apart or when we've only got a handful of specimens. And that also means it's very likely that often either females lack a feature that males have, but they're doing something maybe not quite as dramatic, but they're doing something similar that it's hard to pull apart, or actually females do have big signaling structures as well. This is something few people have heard of. This is mutual sexual selection, where males compete for females, and females compete for males. And that means that females end up with big structures as well, because they're just as interested in signaling and just as interested in getting a best partner as they can that males are. This is something that's been on the books for a long time. Darwin wrote about it in the 1870s. Thomas Henry Huxley wrote it about it in 1904, 1905. But it's only about in the last 20 years we've really started to understand that actually it's quite common in the real world. There's a whole bunch of birds now and a whole bunch of fish and some reptiles where we're starting to see mutual sexual selection, male signaling to females and vice versa. So in something like Triceratops, we've actually got probably 100 good skulls for Triceratops, and every single one of them has horns, and every single one of them has a frill. So we've not got the classic sexual dimorphism, where there's a female with no frill and no horns, like we might expect for things like deer. But we probably have got females in there. Well, we must have females and males in there. But we might still have sexual dimorphism. Maybe females have smaller horns and a smaller frill, and males have bigger horns and a bigger frill, but once you plot them on a graph, they disappear. We actually see the exact same phenomenon with wildebeest. Females are smaller with smaller horns than males, but the biggest females overlap perfectly with the smallest males. And so that could well be what's going on in a lot of dinosaur species, which is why it then becomes very, very hard to pull them apart. But occasionally, we get some weirdos. Um, so this is another oviraptor, or oviraptorosaur. Uh, so one of these uh, theropods from Mongolia. We've got huge numbers of these. Would you believe they're very common in the desert? They preserve very well. Um, this is one of two skeletons that were actually found together, side by side, touching each other. And they're essentially identical in pretty much every detail. So they're as near as damn it, definitely the same species as you can imagine. And you might think, well, that's a pair living together, potentially. Maybe that's a male and female. Is there a difference? And the answer is yes. Uh, unfortunately, uh, despite me taking this photograph myself, I cut off a couple of the crucial details. But let's not mind about that. It's a beautiful skeleton, and that's the main thing. Um, Oviraptorosaurs are one of the groups of feathered dinosaurs. Um, and we've actually got a whole bunch of them from China with very well-preserved feathers. And they actually have a fan-like, or peacock-like fan of feathers at the end of the tail. 
uh, on a whole bunch of skeletons. And that's really interesting, because when you look at these, this pair together, as I said, they're basically identical with one key difference. One of them has a very different structure to the bones at the base of the tail, which would allow the tail to raise up over the head, unlike the other one. So we've now got a pair of animals, potentially a male and female, where the only difference is one can raise and lower what we already think of as a display structure. That immediately suggests we actually have a male-female pair here, and that there is a difference in their skeleton that is directly linked to how they display and communicate to each other. So even on this rare occasion where actually we've only got two skeletons, that's probably enough to talk about serious sexual dimorphism and what it means for communication and display within them. So that's pretty much it. That's everything I was going to talk about today. So as a quick summary, um, Baby dinosaurs, they live together a lot, even when adults didn't. And the main reason they're doing that is they're probably being eaten an awful lot by carnivores who are preferentially targeting them. Sexual dimorphism, it's almost certainly present in dinosaurs, but we simply can't detect it. We don't have the data set. We need hundreds of specimens, very, very complete, in good condition, that also represent a single real population. And basically, the only one we can do that with right now is protoceratops. There's a handful of others we can potentially do it with, but it would be a huge amount of work, and it would still then only be a handful of specimens. But there is real evidence there for groups living together and acting together but it's very few and far between. I am sure huge numbers of dinosaurs were living in groups. Many of them had real social interactions, hierarchies, communication, shared jobs, all the things that we see in modern mammals, modern birds, and even a whole bunch of reptiles. Proving it with the data we have is very, very difficult. And as a final reminder, you know, the wildebeest show us that, the ecological context, what were they doing at the time? Is there anything we know about how they were buried and what the environment was and what might have driven them together is going to be really important to interpreting this data and making sure we get things right. So that's the end of it. I just want to thank a whole bunch of people. I've collaborated with dozens of colleagues over the years on these various papers. But in particular here, Andy Knapp on the left, uh, my PhD student. Well, he's now gone on to his own career at the Natural History Museum. Here he is photographing ceratopsian skulls in a museum basement. Uh, and Rob Nell, who was uh, Andy's other supervisor and a good friend and colleague of mine, uh, staring at a beetle. He works on dung beetles, but I've managed to persuade him that dinosaurs are more interesting, which was important. Uh, but particular thanks to those two and dozens of other colleagues. If you have enjoyed this talk and you're desperate to hear more of me, um, there's my website. I've got a blog. I've got a podcast. I've, I'm on Twitter and other things as well. Um, but I'm here courtesy of my university, Queen Mary University of London. Thank you so much for listening, and thanks you so much, Horatio, for hosting me here today. Thank you.